God bless you. You may be seated. What is God really like? It's a big question. It's a worthy question. It's the kind of a question that uh, draws the very best out of us when we think about it. Little Danny Dutton wasn't overwhelmed by it when his teacher in a Christian school assigned the third grade to write on the nature of God. Little Danny wrote the following. He said, one of God's main, jo main jobs is making people. He makes these to put in the place of the ones that die so there will be enough people to take care of things on earth. He doesn't make grown-ups, just babies. I think because they are smaller and easier to make, that way he doesn't have to take up his valuable time teaching them to talk and to walk. He can just leave that up to mothers and fathers, and I think this works out pretty good. Now, God's second most important job is listening to prayers. An awful lot of this goes on. As some people, like preachers and things, I like that designation, things, pray other times besides bedtime, and Grandpa and Grandma Dutton pray every time they eat except for snacks. God doesn't have time to listen to the radio or TV on account of this as he hears everything, not only prayers. There must be a terrible lot of noise going on in his ears. Unless he has thought of a way to turn it off, I think we should all be a little quieter. God sees everything and hears everything and is everywhere, which keeps him pretty busy. So you wouldn't go wasting his time and you shouldn't go wasting his time asking him for things that aren't important or going over your parents' heads and ask for something that they said you couldn't have. That was Danny Dutton. For an eight-year-old, probably pretty good. But I want to ask you, when you think of the word God, what do you think of? When somebody mentions the name of God, just what kind of a response takes place in your feelings? At a feeling level, what do you feel? Or if, for example, a little six-year-old like Danny Dutton were to come up to you and say, could you tell me what is God like? Who is God? What would you tell them? Now, please understand that we can only know God because he has chosen to reveal himself to us. If it had not been for the fact that God has revealed himself, we would not be able to know God. Knowing God is not something that is born in the fruitful imagination of man. It is something which God ordains is going to be possible that we might be able to comprehend, to understand, to be able to perceive the very nature of God, and God reveals himself to us. There are basically two ways by which we know God. We know God, first of all, by his actions, by the things he says and the things he does. For example, this is what the psalmist had in mind when he said in the 103rd Psalm, he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord and, for and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who filleth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. As far as the psalmist is concerned, God's a pretty good God. And you can tell he's a pretty good God, but the things that he does. It's the kind of a thing that the psalmist had in mind in the 150th Psalm. When he talks here about how great he is, and he says, praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord in the sanctuary. Praise him in the mighty heavens. He said, praise him in the firmament of his power. He said, praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. And for these reasons, we praise him because God is indeed great. Not only do we know God because of his works and the things that he shares through the Holy Spirit, but we also know God, especially through the names that he has allowed to be placed in the Word of God as self-revelations of who he is. Names in the Word of God mean something. I wish somehow that we could get back 
to that time when we gave names to people because they meant something. I can't tell you how glad I am that my parents named me a Bible name, and that name has significance. I learned young what my name meant. And because I knew what that name meant, I have tried all of my life somehow to let that name be characteristic of David Bishop because it happens to be my name. But somehow we have a tendency to think in terms of, well, you know, it just flows. Or it's different than the neighbor across the street who just had a baby. Or whatever the case may be, and we have all kinds of reasons for naming people. I, now, sometimes when we give nicknames, we give nicknames because they mean something. I remember when uh, I was a boy, we had three older boys in the family. I'm number two. And we all had nicknames, and I think we called each other by our nicknames more than we called ourselves by our given names because they meant something. My oldest brother, his name is Joel Allen. We called him Judge. We called him Judge for a very good reason, because he was sober, serious, hardworking, and besides that, he was 30 years old when he was born. <laughs> and he was always Judge. I'm, but you see, names meant something. I want to tell you, my friend, when it comes to the Word of God, and when it comes to the things that the Bible has to say about the nature of God, and the being of God, and particularly the names of God, those names have incredible significance. You see, my friend, of all the names that are given in the Word of God that pertain to God, there are three of them that are more common than any others, and I'm going to talk about those in the next couple of weeks. But first of all, there is the name Jehovah. That is a personal name. It is a name of holiness. It talks about the person of God, and that name appears in Scripture 6,823 times. It is a very common name for Almighty God. As far as the Jew was concerned, it was so holy that they very seldomly mentioned it. But it was indeed a holy name. It was a powerful name. Not only was there Jehovah, but there was also Elohim. And the word Elohim is an unusual word. It is a word that appears 2,570 times in Scripture. The third most common name in Scripture for God is the name Adonai. It is a word which, as it relates to God, appears about 300 times. It is used oftentimes in the place of another word. It appears also as it relates to man. It is an idea that has to do with lordship and authority, and it appears in that consequence 215 times. But these are the primary names. For just a few moments that I have left this morning, I want to talk to you about that very special name, the oldest of the names as far as the revelation is concerned. I want to talk about Elohim the Creator God, the God of all power, and the one who brought all of this into being. When you think about that word Elohim, it is an unusual word. It has a variable designation. For example, there is a singular form of that verb. The, verb, the word itself is a plural word. Elohim is plural. It doesn't speak of one, but it speaks of an idea of plurality, however that is. But it has a singular form, and the singular form is El. It is very old. It is one of those words that was used in the Semitic world before we even heard some of these other things. It was the common word that was used among the Semites to refer generically to God. You see, it's the same kind of a word that we have in English. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or whether you're a heathen, but you want to talk about the idea of deity, you use the word G-O-D. It is a generic word. It is the word God. It was that kind of a word as far as the Semites were concerned. It's the same kind of a word that the Hispanics have when they say Dios, or the same kind of a word that the Italians have when they say Dios, or the same kind of a word that the Greeks have when they say Theos. It is that kind of a generic designation for Almighty God. But when you come to the word Elohim, it is a word that first of all speaks of triunity as far as God is concerned. It is not just one essence, but there is a sense in which there is plurality of essence, plurality of being, trinity of being in one essence, and Elohim suggests that. Now, I want to be fair. There's a lot of people who wouldn't agree with that. There's a lot of people who will tell you that the plurality of Elohim 
is something that does not refer to numbers but refers to quantity. It has the idea of intensification. But as far as I am concerned, I opt for that position that has been held from the day of the early church fathers, that when the Bible uses the word Elohim and it uses that plural designation, there is a sense in which it is speaking of plurality. There is a sense in which it is speaking of more than one in the essence of unity, of oneness. And that is there. I want to use just one verse all the time I'm going to have. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, it's the kind of a verse that when Israel talks about who their God is and what He's like, this is the verse they go to. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now that's a tremendous statement. But you see, my friend, when you understand what those words are in the Hebrew, all of a sudden it falls into perspective. And there's something very special and unusual about that word. Because what he is really saying here is the Lord, our God, is one Lord. That first word, Lord, is the word Jehovah. Jehovah is always used in the singular. It is never plural. It is always singular. When you are talking about Jehovah, you are only talking about one entity, one being, one person, one whatever the case it is. In the person of God, it is Jehovah God. There is only one. But it says, uh, Jehovah, our God. That word God is Elohim. And that is plural. It is saying that Jehovah, singular, our Elohim, plural, is nevertheless one Lord Jehovah. That's what he's saying. He's saying that Jehovah, singular, is our God, Elohim, plural, and yet nevertheless, that is still just one entity. That is Jehovah. Now, an interesting part of that verse is the little qualifying word, one. One Lord. Now, if the Hebrew wanted to express the idea of oneness, he could have used one of two different words. If he wanted to express the idea that there was no divisibility, that this essence was indivisible, you couldn't separate it, you couldn't divide it, you couldn't in any sense look at it other than as one unit, he would have used the Hebrew word yachad or yahid. It's the word which means without divisibility. Oneness, the essence of oneness. But that isn't the word he uses. He uses the other word. And what he is saying is Jehovah is our Elohim. But nevertheless, even though he has that plural aspect, he is still singly one Jehovah. He has the essence of plurality in that very special sense of unity. And he is one. Not only is Elohim try unity in the person of God. There are other verses I could use it only at the time. But he is also the powerful God. Because when that word Elohim is used in Scripture, it is almost always used in the context of power or might or creative force or whatever the case may be. You see, my friend, when the derivation from which this word El comes is understood, it is the very idea of, first of all, beginnings, or secondly, lordship as it relates to uh, authority, or finally, of power or of might. And that is the background of the word. It expresses that kind of an idea. But the very first time that you find Elohim used in Scripture, it's used in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Genesis. In fact, for the first 35 verses of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, it is used 35 different times. It is the only word and designation that is used for God until you come to the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, Elohim. And this first verse introduces us to the kind of an Elohim powerful being this God is. It's the verse that you learn when you began learning verses from the Old Testament. It says simply, in the beginning, God, Elohim is the word, created the heavens and the earth. What that simply says is uh, that that triune essence of Godness was there and they were involved totally and completely in the creation of this which we call the universe. Now you say, does that really hold with the rest of Scripture? 
Because when I thought of creation, I always thought of God as being the creator, and the idea I had of God was the fatherhood of God, and that, that personification. Does this really hold with Scripture? I want you to notice verse 2 of chapter 1, Genesis 1. Verse 2 says, And the Spirit of Elohim, the Spirit of God, moved upon the face of the waters. When you come to the New Testament, the one who was given the credit for bringing creation into being in the New Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ as the creative agency in the Godhead that brought all of this into being. Hear the words of John, as he says in John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. He said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word he's talking about here is the Logos, the expression of the Almighty. And he tells us who that is in the 14th verse. That is the one who came and dwelt among us. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, in the beginning, whenever that was, uh, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. I want to tell you, friend, you have to understand that all of that is there. And that Word, that Lord Jesus Christ, was there from the beginning. Not only that, but He said all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Apostle Paul agrees with that. Because in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6, 16, the Apostle Paul says, For by Him were all things made that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were made by Him and for Him. He made all things. That's the same thing that the writer of Hebrews has to say in the first chapter, in verse 1, when he says, For God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, notice this, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom all so He made the world. I want you to know, my friend, that this Elohim included all of those when the Bible says, and God Elohim created the world. I can't think of anything more powerful than creation. But in your life, maybe it isn't creation that you need. And I think of the life of Abraham. And I think of how that when Abraham was 75 years of age, God made him a promise. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And that son's going to be the son of promise. And I'm going to make of you a great nation. And your children are going to be as many as the stars of heaven. They're going to be as great as the sands of the seashore. You are going to have a son. 75 years of age. 85 years of age, no boy. No son. 85 or 86 years of age, whatever the case may be, he decides to fulfill that by the flesh. He has a relationship with Hagar. Ishmael is born in chapter 16, verse 16. And uh, that isn't the answer. And there's another 13 years. 13 more years and doesn't hear from God. God, way back when I was 75, you gave me a promise. Way back when I was 75, you made a covenant. Have you ever been there, my friend, when you wondered, God, did you remember the promise that you made? Have you ever been there when somehow you knew that you knew that you knew that that was your promise, but somehow the time is gone and it isn't there anymore? God, do you remember that? In the 17th chapter and the first verse of the book of Genesis, the Bible says in Abram, Isaac isn't born yet, the promise, the covenant hasn't been totally fulfilled yet. The Bible says Abram was 90 years old and nine, 13 years after Ishmael was born. Who all things. He hasn't answered the prayer yet, but he says, I want to tell you who I am. I want to tell you who I am. El is the beginning of Elohim. It is a singular form. When that form is used in the singular with other appellations, it tells us the kind of a being that this Elohim really is. And he says, I am El Shaddai. I am the Almighty God. And he says, walk before me and be thou perfect. And you will discover that in the next few verses, he reminds him of the covenant. He said, I want to tell you that I'm a covenant-keeping God. And he said, because my name is El Shaddai, I am a covenant-keeping God. He said, I can do anything. It may seem impossible. Your wife may seem too old. You think it can't happen. He said, I want to tell you that the boy's going to come. But I want to tell you something else. He said, you've been a stranger here in this land. You've been going 
going up and down through Canaan. He said, I want to tell you that everywhere you have gone as a pilgrim and a sojourner, he said, I'm going to give that to your people as an inheritance for generation upon generation, even forever. Now, I don't want to get into politics, but I want to tell you, friend, that when it comes to understanding what God's intentions are, and it doesn't really matter where you are in the whole Arab-Israeli conflict. You need to remember what God said about it way back when. And you need to understand that when all is said and done, that's the way it's going to come down the pike. And you see, my friend, he said that's going to be theirs. And it's going to be theirs from generation unto generation, even forever. Why? Because the one who is the covenant-keeping God, who has all the power in heaven and in earth, El Shaddai, has said that's going to be so. But the one I want to share with you quickly here. Can you come to the second slide? The next one. Elohim is the God who is with us. Hallelujah. He's the God who is with us. He's not only triunity in perfect essence, He is not only creator and all powerful, almighty God, but He is many faceted. There is no name for God. Remember this. There is no name for God that is able to capture all of what He is. No name. Every name takes just a facet and it pulls aside the robes so you can see something about the heart of this one who is called by this name. It only gives us one facet of one who is as great as he is. But in the compound nature of the words that are derived from the word Elohim and the singular El, there are seven of them, major ones in Scripture. In the 14th chapter of Genesis, when Abraham's on his way back from the Battle of the Kings, he stops with Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is king, is, is servant of what? The Most High God. That's El Elyon. Why is that significant? Because in that early Semitic world, there were other Semites that had gods that they referred to as El. But there's one that is above all of the so-called gods of the other people. There was an El Elyon. There was a Most High one. And that's the one whom Melchizedek is serving. You come down to the 16th chapter and you have Hagar here. And Hagar feels left out. The angel of the Lord comes to her and the angel says, Hagar, you're going to have a son. You're going to call him Ishmael. And God reveals a new name to Hagar. I'm El Roy. I'm the God who sees. You thought nobody cared. You thought everybody overlooked you. I want you to know you're not overlooked. El Roy is there. He's the God who sees. And then he comes down. And he comes to the 17th chapter, the one I just shared with you. And he spoke to Abram and he said, Abram, he said, I want to tell you I'm a covenant-keeping God. Why? Because I can do it. I'm El Shaddai. I'm the all-powerful God. And then you come to the 21st chapter. Hey, as Isaac is now born, and Abraham has found a plot of ground, and down there at a place called Beersheba, he has a grove of trees, and he sets up an altar, and he begins to worship, and God reveals himself as a new God, as El Olam. He's the everlasting God. He's not just here today. He's not going to just be able to take care of you this month. But he's going to be there next month. He's going to be there this year. He's going to be there next year. He's going to be there whenever you need him. Because he's El Olam. He is the everlasting God. And Jacob was on his way fleeing from his brother Esau. And he spent the night. And he slept. And he had a vision. And he had a vision of a, of a ladder going from earth to heaven. 
and running up and down to the angels and he wakes in the morning and he raises up a stone and he pours oil upon it and he said, surely this is the house of God, Bethel. But later on, 31st chapter of Genesis, God speaks to Jacob and he identifies himself as God. But he said, if you want to know the God that I am, he said, I am El Bethel. I am the God of the house of God back there. That was the house of God. I'm the God of that house. Aren't you glad because El Bethel is here this morning? Aren't you glad because El Bethel is here this morning? The God of the house of God is here this morning. And Elohim is His name. He's here today. Not only that, but He said also, here you have Jacob. And Jacob has run away from God. Done so many things. You remember his name, Jacob? You remember what that meant? The name that is given here in this passage in 33 of, it, of uh, Genesis is El Elohe Israel. It means literally the God, God, the God of the Prince of God. Does that make any sense? It does when you go back to chapter 32. What was, David's, what was Jacob's name before? Jacob was called heel grabber, supplanter, conniver. You give me a chance, I will get the best of you. That was his name. But you remember that that night he wrestles with an angel. I personally think it was Jeho I think it was Jesus. But he wrestles with an angel. And he wrestles all night. And in the morning he prevails. And you remember that his name is changed. He is no longer called Jacob. But he is now called Israel. Which means Prince of God. And all of a sudden when he comes back to Shechem and he raises up an altar and he names it he names it as an altar to the God of the God of the Prince of God that was Jacob and then you have one more you read about it first of all in the ninth chapter of the book of Isaiah and there it's given as a prophecy concerning Jesus that this choir sang about so incredibly this morning the mighty God, El Gibor. In the book of Jeremiah, when God is revealing through Jeremiah how great He is, He goes through a whole string of His names. And in there is this new name, El Gibor. The mighty or great God. God above all others. I want you to notice something. Every one of these names that pertains to Elohim is all tied up in one, in the person of one person, as far as you and I are concerned. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the prophet gave the first testimony. He gave the first witness. Would you go to the next slide? He gave the first witness. Isaiah said, chapter 7, verse 14, he said, For the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name, what? Emmanuel. What does that mean? When you turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, And these things came to pass, so that it, so that it might be brought to pass the saying that was, that was the same, that behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, God with us. I want to tell you, my friend, that every one of those names of Elohim, every one of those names of El, he is El Yom the Most High. He is also all of these other appellations of who he is, but all of that is tied up in Emmanuel. And this Emmanuel came, and he dwelt among us, and his name is Jesus, and it is God among us. It is Emmanuel. It is Elohim. And I'm so glad because He's here. Every single one of those designations uh, suddenly become wrapped up in this one and He is here. I want to tell you, my friend, that whatever you need, He is the Most High. He is the one who sees. He is the Almighty. He is the Everlasting. He is the God in the house of God. He is the God who is able in all things to be the Prince over His people. And He is the great and the mighty God. And that God is among us in Emmanuel. And He is here today. I don't know what your needs are. 
I don't know what your problems are, but I want to tell you that that Elohim, he can take care of them as far as you're concerned. Jim White tells a story. Jim White, author, tells a story. Driving home one day, picked his little boy up at the daycare, six years old, <clears throat> and Jim's overwhelmed. More to do than he get done. Just upset, really frustrated, downright discouraged, and he thought to himself, why should I carry this without sharing it with this little boy who probably loves his daddy as much as any little boy loves his daddy? And as he was driving, he began to say, son, I just think you need to know that today your daddy is really frustrated. He's had more than he can get done. He's got so many things to do, he doesn't know how in the world he's going to be able to get them done. He said, son, I am really, really discouraged. And he just drove and all of a sudden he was aware there was a little old head laid up alongside of his shoulder. And he didn't know what that meant. And all of a sudden the little fellow just moved up a little higher, leaned over that shoulder pad and whispered in his ear. And he said, Daddy, Jesus will help you if you ask him. And I want to tell you this morning that how big your problem is and how impossible it seemed before you came to church this morning, Jesus will help you if you ask him because he is Emmanuel. He is all that is contained in Elohim in one. And he is here as the God who is among us. And he wants to minister to your need. I want you to stand with me. If you would please, we're going to sing a chorus. If you're here today and you just need to open your heart, you just need to cry out to him. You just need perhaps to lay it on the altar. You just need to reach out, whatever it is. But I want to tell you that these altars are open right now. And I invite you to come. I invite you to lay it down. I invite you to understand what it means when he says that he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. All that that is entailed in all of the compound names of El and all that it implies in Elohim, the triune God, the creator of the universe. He is here today and he wants to minister to your name. If you will just simply open your heart to him, these altars are open. Would you come while we sing this chorus and would you let God, would you let God manifest himself in the person of this Emmanuel to you today?